steel. <laughs> Wait, stop! Why in the hell are we even fighting? Uh, well, you see, back in the- Just kidding. I actually don't fucking care. But you care, or at least I assume you do because you clicked on the video. So why exactly are we fighting in TF2? Why are we pushing this card to this one area, capturing this control point, destroying these robots? Well, there's actually quite an interesting storyline beneath all this gameplay. In fact, out of all Valve games, this game has the most expansive storyline. And if you don't want to take my word for it, Valve even said that themselves. You'll also be able to see firsthand when I try and explain this labyrinth of a story in this video. Team Fortress 2 wasn't always like this though, and at its launch is really just a wacky sequel to the other popular Valve game, Team Fortress Classic. But TF2's lovable lineup of characters and really cool art style had players and fans demanding more story out of this game. The first actual comic expanding upon TF2's universe as well wouldn't even be published until one year and seven months after the initial release of TF2. After that, Valve decided that they were going to dedicate themselves with fleshing out this unknown world of TF2 and give it its own storyline and character along the way. I've made sure to read the 300 plus pages of Team Fortress 2 comics, which is hard for my little brain, and have decided to try my best to summarize the story and also make it comprehensible. Firstly, I'm going to start with the beginning lore and exposition then I'm going to get to the full story of TF2 that arrives later on. So strap in, grab a notepad or two, and enjoy this lore that goes a lot deeper than just two teams fighting. To start things off, we're beginning all the way back in the year 1850. Zephaniah Mann travels from England all the way to the US of A in efforts to buy land for his weapon and munition company, Manco. His two sons, Redman and Blue Tarch, somehow convince him that it's a good idea to buy most of the state of New Mexico. This large area that they bought is called the Badlands. While Zephaniah Mann had been traveling all across America looking for land to buy, he contracted many illnesses, which ended up killing him. In his will, he leaves his company, Manco, to his trusted aide, Barnabas Hale, all of his wealth to his maidservant, Elizabeth, and lastly, all of the Badlands to his two sons, Redman and Blue Tarch. The only problem was they had to share this land, and these brothers did not want to share, no matter how worthless this land actually was. So they both hired a team of nine mercenaries to fight over this land, thus sparking the Gravel Wars. Forty years passed, and the two man brothers, Redman and Blue Tarch, were still in a stalemate over the Badlands. No one was winning, and they were getting old. So Blue Tarch had an idea. If he couldn't win this war, then he'll just have to outlive his brother. So Blue Tarch contracted the work from Radigan Koniger, which Radigan is actually the father of the engineer from Team Fortress Classic, as well as the grand father for the engineer in Team Fortress 2. Anyways, Radigan was tasked with making the LEM or life extending machine that will basically make Blue Tarch immortal. That was until Elizabeth, the maidservant I mentioned earlier, approached Radigan to make one for Redman as well. She does this by convincing him with some Australian. For context to what Australian even is, it's an all powerful element only found in Australia, which allowed them to make some crazy technology and will even increase intelligence and virility if they're exposed to it. I mean, just look at how Australia looked in 1890. For some reason though, Elizabeth really wanted to keep these two brothers fighting, which you'll figure out just why later on. Radigan makes the life extending machine for both of the brothers, which just ends up extending the gravel wars into the second generation of mercenaries. These mercenaries being the ones in Team Fortress Classic, and it's now the year 1930. The TF Classic crew actually has a lot more to do with the story than you would think, but nothing too interesting happens with the story in this time jump other than just these same old gravel wars being fought, but with a new set of mercenaries. So let's jump ahead in time to when all the TF2 mercenaries are hired. It's never exactly said what year they recruited, but it was most likely in the year 1964. The current owner of Manco is some Australian chest haired bloke named Saxon Hale, which is the great grandchild of Barnabas Hale, who is the one that inherited ownership over Manco. While Saxon Hale was the owner of Manco, he wasn't actually the one pulling the strings over the whole gravel wars. That would be somebody named the Administrator, a mysterious figure that even Manco doesn't like to name. The Administrator has been orchestrating the whole gravel wars behind the scenes for over a hundred years. She's also the owner of Team Fortress Industries, which basically owns like everything in the Team Fortress universe, including Manco itself. During gameplay in TF2, you can even hear her over the intercom. Alert! Our last control point is being captured. And she also looks an awful lot like Elizabeth. That's because it most likely is Elizabeth, although it's never flat out stated. Technically, the administrator's name is Helen, but that's just her code name. It's still shown that she's been alive since at least 1850. Now, how the hell is she still alive over 100 years later? Well, spoiler alert, she has an immortality machine inside of her as well. Although hers does seem to be a bit more sophisticated than the brothers, probably because her machine uses more Australium. The Australium alone is most likely the entire motive on why the administrator has been perpetrated 
trading the gravel wars for so long. She's also been stockpiling Australium, so it's pretty obvious what she wants. The administrator also has an assistant in her whole scheme of things named Miss Pauling, who will be very important to the story. Miss Pauling pretty much just does stuff for the administrator out in the real world that the administrator can't do because she's too busy administrating or something. Now that I've got most of the exposition and past stuff out of the way, we can now move on to the new storyline that starts to emerge later on in the TF2 lore. But real quick, let's move away from the gravel wars and focus on a completely different war going on. War Thunder. War Thunder is probably a game you've heard about quite a lot, and for a good reason. It's basically the ultimate vehicle war game with over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships that can all be fought against each other. There are even 10 major nations that can fight and different vehicles throughout many years. The game also looks great and is honestly quite fun, having you fight different vehicles of all types in an immersive battle. War Thunder is available for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox, and using my link in the pinned comment or video description, you'll get yourself a massive bonus pack. For new or returning players, who've been MIA for at least 6 months, there's a ton waiting for you, including multiple premium vehicles and an exclusive vehicle decorator, the Eagle of Valor. Plus you'll get 100,000 silver lions and 7 days of premium account time. Remember this offer won't last forever, it's for a limited time only. So once again make sure to check it out using my link and thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the story. I'm gonna go a bit fast here, so get ready. I'm also skipping a lot for time's sake, so check out the comics. The year is now 1971. The two brothers, Redman and Blue Tarch, are still getting very old. So old, in fact, that their immortality machines aren't working well enough to keep them alive. And during a meeting, they have a genius idea to create a machine that can get them pregnant, so at least someone can inherit the Badlands. Thankfully, that idea never came to fruition, because shortly after they had that idea, a mysterious man introduces himself. It turns out that there was actually a third brother in the Man family, and his name is is Grey Man. How creative. Apparently Grey had been born at the same time as them, but he was a little different, so his dad wanted to smother him. But in perfect timing, an eagle swooped through a window and took him to safety, never to be seen again until right now. Grey Man introduces himself and also reveals that he has a far more advanced immortality machine than the brothers. Grey also explains how pointless this whole war has been, but points out that there is actually one thing worth fighting for, the Manco company itself and all the Australium. But keep in mind the brothers didn't own Manco, they just owned the Badlands. The true owner of Manco at the moment is Saxton Hale. So being no use to Grey, Grey kills both of his brothers and plans to take over Manco. This is when he launches his robot army to attack and conquer the Badlands, which is why everyone is fighting in the man versus machine game mode. This war goes on for about a year with no one winning, similar to the Gravel Wars. But not being as dumb as his brothers, Grey Man decides to take another approach. You see, Saxon Hale created something called the Manco Challenge, in which if anyone can beat him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they will become the rightful owner of Manco. So Grey uses this challenge to his advantage by having Saxon Hale fight his daughter Olivia. Obviously, Saxon Hale doesn't want to fight this little girl, so he gives up and hands over his company to Olivia and Grey. Grey then takes over Manco as the new rightful owner, all the mercenaries are fired, and the administrator is nowhere to be found. For the next six months, Grey tries his hardest to search for all of Manco's Australian caches, but no luck. He even employs the work of a mysterious figure who I will get to later. After those six months, Miss Pauling decides that she's going to take it upon herself to get all the mercenaries back together again. Soldier was found in the house of his old roommate Merasmus, Pyro was somehow the new CEO of a company named Frontier Engineering, Demo Man was back at home unemployed and depressed, and Spy and Scout were in the midst of a trial to be hanged due to their many crimes committed. This is also in the town of Two Fort, which is just one of many actual cities that were inside the Badlands. Even though it may appear that everything is just factories in barren desert on most maps, there are actually some populated areas that have people living there. Anyways, while Miss Pauling was in the town of Two Fort to help spy and scout, she actually ended up meeting with the administrator in an alley. The administrator, who isn't looking too good, informs Miss Pauling that there is only just one last cache of Australium, and they must go and get it, which they will get to in a bit. First, they have to find Heavy in the middle of Siberia, which they do find along with his family and Soldier falls in love with his sister Zana. They then all split up, having Miss Pauling and Demo Man go to Australia to search for Sniper, who is in his parents' abandoned house, where we learn that Sniper's parents that he grew up with aren't his actual real parents. Meanwhile, Spy, Soldier, and Zana steal a submarine, and Heavy and Scout go to one of the last Australian mines where they actually run into Saxon Hale along with his old girlfriend Mags. After all that, Miss Pauling along with Demo Man, Spy, Sniper, Pyro, Soldier, and Zana all stuff into that submarine they stole to search for the very last cache of Australium that was actually in New Zealand. Zealand. New Zealand in the TF2 universe is quite different than it is in our real world. While Australia was too busy being rich in Australium and chock full of virility, New Zealand had another problem on its hands. Some crazy guy who just so happened to be Sniper's real father convinces the entire country of New Zealand that they must build a dome around their entire country and move it underwater before the whole earth gets covered in magma. Although no magma ever came, the country actually survived underneath the sea, somehow. That was until Sniper's father had another genius idea. Still scared of the magma that he has foreseen, he decides to take matters into his own hands by 
flying away into space with the rocket ship he had built, leaving behind his wife and infant son because there's only room for one person. This of course upsets his wife, not wanting to be left alone while her husband basically leaves them to die, so they get into a bit of an argument. The infant sniper then sneaks into the rocket, blasting straight through the dome, and then lands in the middle of rural Australia where he would meet his new parents. Meanwhile, down in the dome of New Zealand, there is now a giant hole with the ocean seeping through, and that is the story of New Zealand. Miss Pauling and her crew arrive in the former dome of New Zealand that is now flooded, and head to the last known location of the Australium. At that last cache, they actually manage to run into Sniper's old dad, who is much older, but welcomes him with open arms. And his mother is even also still alive, because they both locked themselves in the lab while the rest of New Zealand drowned. It also turns out that the last of the Australium is gone. Well, the last of it was actually used to paint their rocket ship, so thankfully it's not technically gone. Oh wait, now it's really gone, and in space along with Sniper's mom. This of course causes the lab to flood again, because because there is now a giant hole in the roof. Miss Pauling and the crew try to escape to their submarine, but the dad ends up stealing it and leaves them all to drown. The door then opens back up, giving them some hope that maybe he came back, but it turns out that some other people actually arrived. Those people are the entire crew of the old Team Fortress game, Team Fortress Classic, oh, and Medic. It turned out that the mysterious figure that was hired by Grey earlier was the classic heavy from Team Fortress Classic, and in typical villain fashion, he betrayed Grey Man to find the Australian himself, because they needed to make their own immortality machines. Classic Heavy along with his crew tried down that last cache of Australium, which was in this lab. Wasting no time, they shoot Sniper and kill him, poor Sniper, and they all get captured. Soldier and Zana are getting tortured together by Pyro from TF Classic, and Grey Man is also there, who got his immortality machine ripped right out of his back. Zana later breaks loose by cutting off her hand, and then kills Pyro by inflating her with a smoke grenade. Do not show this to Pyro Cynical. Soldier and Zana break out to go find the rest of the team, along with Grey Man. We then see Pyro, Demo Man, Spy, and Miss Pauling locked in a cell together. Spy and Miss Pauling are about to take a cyanide capsule, but before they can do that, Heavy breaks through the door to save them. He then asks where they can find the administrator at, which Miss Pauling happily tells him the exact at coordinates. But it turns out that Heavy was actually disguised classic spy. Thankfully, Zana and Soldier show up just in time to rescue them. They also brought Dying Grey along with them. Grey tells Miss Pauling that whatever he had planned with the Australium, the administrator's plan is much worse and they need to stop her. Miss Pauling tells him to fuck off and that she is too loyal to turn her back on the administrator and Grey dies during her speech. Later, we can see Medic who is running with the classic crew now trying to bring back Sniper from the dead. And it works. Classic Heavy comes in and sees that Medic brought back the person that they killed and is obviously pretty upset. While Classic Heavy was busy bitching out Medic, Naked Sniper manages to slip away. And this is also where we see a pretty obvious foreshadow of what Medic will do. Since there's technically no more Australium in existence on Earth, Classic Heavy plans to use these robots to suck out the Australium out of the bodies of the Australians. Apparently Australians also have it in their blood. I don't know, it confused me as well. And while Miss Pauling and everyone escapes, they end up getting attacked by those blood sucking robots and die. Thankfully, Medic saves the day once again by dumping buckets of blood back into them. Don't ask me how that works. Heavy and Scouts show up after parachuting from a plane and meet back up with everyone. They all get surrounded by Grey's robots with no weapons until Saxon Hill and his girlfriend Mag show up to save them. While they're fighting off all the robots, we can see Heavy in the sights of Classic Sniper until Spy comes in who's disguised as their engineer. But Classic Sniper sees right through this and shoots him in the foot. Thankfully, he takes his time killing Spy, giving enough time for a naked revive sniper to come up behind him and kill him. Back outside now, we can find Medic helping out Demo Man, where out of nowhere Classic Heavy shows up. He demands that Medic puts Grey's immortality machine inside of him. But like I said earlier with the foreshadowing, Medic stabs Heavy. But he somehow gets back up from this, and an epic battle ensues. Heavy eventually shows up to help Medic, but Classic Heavy shoots Medic and kills him. And then another epic battle ensues. Oh, and during this, Pyro is also burning Classic Demo Man and Scout to death. Back outside to all the fighting, Soldier and Zana are busy destroying robots while naked and covered in honey. Saxon and mags are fist fighting robots just like back in the day, and Miss Pauling and Scout split up, with Scout going inside to fight the robots or to look for Spy. Bad idea, buddy. Heavy and Classic are also still fighting as well, and Heavy was actually winning by quite a lot, until Classic Heavy manages to just shove the immortality machine inside of him, which fills him with the virility of Australium. Back inside, Naked Sniper and Spy are making their way out of the building they were in. That's when they find poor Scout bleeding out after fighting the robots all alone. Before Scout could die, Spy tries his best to comfort him. He does this by disguising himself as Tom Jones, which is a side story I won't bother to explain. Spy admits to Scout that he's his real father, which by the way has been a thing hinted at over years of TF2 lore, so this was kind of a big deal when it was shown. And then Scout then dies in Spy's arms. Rest in peace. But nope, he's back alive, because he just talked to God, and God said that he needs a second chance to have sex with more women. Yeah. Back outside, everyone is still fighting until Miss Pauling gets a call from the administrator. Well, not actually the administrator, but from the blue engineer who was helping her. The administrator was actually dead. 
but she'll be fine. Engineer tells Miss Pauling that they need the Australian for her, but she tells him it's all gone. Heavy and Classic Heavy are still fighting, while Dead Medic is in hell talking to the devil. He somehow manages to talk his way out of dying and comes back because apparently it's fucking impossible for any of them to actually die. Medic saves Heavy by using a pen he took from hell to trick Classic Heavy into thinking it's a detonator. A detonator that will impregnate all the Classic crew because, and I forgot to mention this earlier, Medic actually put baboon uteruses inside of all of them. He believes it, which gives enough time for Heavy to rip out the immortality machine and destroy it. Miss Pauling and the crew walk up to Classic Heavy as he's dying, and she says the iconic words, we are Team Fortress, before he dies. Cut to a scene of the administrator being revived from her immortality machine and having the engineer tell her that he has the last bit of Australium on the earth for her. If she just waits a bit longer, they can make the Mark V machine and this last bit of Australium could actually last her about 6 more months of her life. The administrator has other plans though and uses the last of the Australium on earth for her inefficient Mark IV machine and cuts her time of living from 6 months to an hour if she's lucky. And in typical Valve fashion, they end the story there. Nothing after this. Nada. It's actually been over 7 years since this last comic was made. One of the writers, Jay Pinkerton, said he was working on it until he left Valve in June of 2017, a couple months after the latest comic was released. He apparently rejoined Valve in 2018, but no other information about the final comic has been released since. Fans of course have made a ton of theories on how this story actually ends, and there is even a supposed real ending that was leaked on 4chan. Richter Overtime made a great video on it, so I'd recommend checking that out if you're interested. But until now, there is no conclusive ending to this story. If you want, you can sign the change.org petition to finish the final comic that has about 1400 signatures. I'll go ahead and put that in the description if it makes you feel better. Once again, thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video, and make sure to check them out using my links in the description or pinned comment to get that bonus pack. Also, thanks for sticking till the end of this video. I know it isn't like my usual ones, considering I usually make shorter Counter-Strike videos, but I'd really love to just make more videos on any Source games or Valve titles in the future. I've also been torturing myself with speedrunning Counter-Strike Condition Zero on my Twitch, which I will make into a video eventually, so make sure to check out my streams if you can. If you liked the video, make sure to like it and subscribe. And if you didn't like it, fuck you. I'm just kidding. Okay, bye.